Ed told me he was going to have a PowerPoint. <laughs> that wasn't a PowerPoint, all right? And us non-PowerPoint people have a problem with PowerPoint people, but now I have a problem with pig-throwing people. <laughs> Okay, well luckily I began this by saying that tonight I have a not very sexy task, and that's to talk about policy. But I'm going to ask you for the next 10 minutes to sort of close your eyes and go into a place where you're going to suspend your suspicions of government, you're going to set aside all your preconceived notions about what doing policy is, right? You're going to you're going to put away your hatred for bureaucratic wrangling and red tape. And tonight, we're just going to think about policy as a tool, OK? Like a knife to a chef or a shovel to a farmer, policy can also be a tool. It's a part of our movement's toolkit that, if properly wielded, it can add power to our movements. It can add power to our businesses. It can grow our projects if we use policy correctly. <laughs> Imagine a world where every time you paid your taxes, you thought, I'm investing in my local food system. You had the added benefit of knowing that you were a primary stakeholder in a food system by just being a regular citizen. That's policy properly executed. But most of us ignore policy. Some of us are business owners, and that business is like a child. It takes up all of our time. Some of us are parents. Others of us are farmers. We're students. We're chefs. We don't have time for policy. Those of us who do engage in policy, often we're locked in this sort of defensive policy mode. We let big landholders, we let Monsanto, we let Safeway write our policy, and we're fighting against it constantly. And we have huge things to fight against. Right? We're fighting against the diversion of our water. We're fighting against the rezoning of our land. We're fighting against houses. But today, I want to say that if policy is a tool, it can also be a weapon. And it can be creatively wielded, again, to add power to our movements, to add power to our businesses, to empower our students. So, what then could the policy expressions of these creative, awesome, Kanaka momics, pig-throwing chef movement, what could the policy expressions of that be? OK. But what if we follow the example of New York? Just this past August, New York City po passed a city-focused policy bundle. And that policy bundle addressed New York City's food system from farm to table. The first thing they did is they created measures of accountability and tracking to ensure that the city was procuring more local food. Right? If we don't know what our institutions are procuring, we don't know how to change it. The next thing the policy did is they created a searchable database which said, where is vacant city land? Can it be farmed? And if so, how can we connect it with growers? The city also removed height, building height restrictions to greenhouses to make greenhouses more affordable and more accessible to urban growers, right? Imagine, then, if policy allowed town and country to no longer be mutually exclusive. Rather than simply worrying about country being townified, what if we countrified town, right? What if Honolulu started growing some of its own food rather than constantly encroaching upon ag land outside of its limits. That's policy, properly executed. In Seattle, the city has a goal of making one community garden that's city funded available to every 1,500 residents. Right? So we have a growing mo movement of school growers, of community gardeners, of home growers. Policy takes that movement to the next level. Policy can be a tool. It can grow our movement, right? Or what if we took Madison, Wisconsin as an example? In Madison, the city government partnered with their primary health insurance pro provider to offer a full rebate on CSA subscriptions. Imagine HMSA or Kaiser paying for your CSA box, right? That's policy properly executed. 
At the state level, grassroots social movements have done even more. In California, the state just awarded a $15 million block grant to organizations like Dexter's. They said, let's create school gardens, not just at private schools, but at public schools in low-income areas where students otherwise do not have access to healthy, fresh, locally grown food. That's policy. In New Mexico, the Food Policy Council was able to re uh, relax restrictions on home-based food processors. So just like here, we now see the legalization of pot yang. Policy could allow for our KCC culinary students to start their own businesses without the high overhead of certified commercial kitchen. Right? This is policy driving local business and fostering entrepreneurs. But to manifest these visions here, we need to make the policy process participatory. We all have to see ourselves as participants in our governmental structures. We cannot expect our elected officials to pass these things for us. They won't, they can't. Right? And if the Abercrombie administration has been a lesson to any of us, it's that we have to show up and we have to start participating. So imagine, what kind of food safety program would emerge if we had the farmers at Mako Farms or Lisa show up and sit down with these large risk-averse retailers like Safeway or the Hilton Hawaiian Hotel? And we sat them down also with state officials that are interested in economic development and more local farming. What would food safety look like then? Now, the farmers at Ma'o Farms might not want to have that conversation. They might not be interested in sourcing to hotels or sourcing to businesses like Safeway. But the point is that their experiences and their expertise matter. And that that experience needs to be put on the table as we start to craft policy. Right? Or what if Ed Kenny? and Mark Noguchi back there who's texting, right? What if they sat down and started to craft DOE menus, right? What if they said, what does local-centric, culturally appropriate food look like, not just for our cakey in schools, but also for our low-income families that are offered free cooking classes through SnapEd? What would that look like? Again, Mark not, might not be interested in that. Ed might not be interested in that. But their expertise matters. And together, policy can start to change. We need to create spaces for dialogue and discussion. We need to be able to tackle the hard issues. But we need to get together in a room, and we need to do it now. Right? Most of the policies I've referenced here were pushed through because citizens, everyday people, chefs, business owners, students, moms, got together and created food task forces, or agricultural and food advisory committees, or food policy councils. But they began to see themselves as stakeholders in the political process. But the point also isn't where this is going to happen, because frankly it could happen anywhere, it's when. And the time is now. We have a friendly administration. We have people across government the time for the food movement, I mean, it's palpable. There's 200 people here on a Tuesday night. We have to start now. And it's our ability and our right to participate in these democratic processes that actually defines us as citizens of a democracy. Right? It's what makes us Americans. So I want to end with a quote by one of my muses, Arundhati Roy, who's an activist in India. And she writes, it's important to remember that our freedoms, such as they are, were never given to us by any government. They were wrested by us. If we do not test them from time to time, they will atrophy. If we do not guard them constantly, they will be taken away from us. And if we do not demand more and more, we will be left with less and less. So my call to arms today is to ask all of you to start demanding more and more. Not just of yourselves, not just of your farmers, not just of your chefs, but also of your government. It's time that we demand more.